Hello everyone. Welcome to season 2, episode 1 of Data Perspectives podcast presented by Data New England. Data New England is an educational and networking resource for the data management community. And this podcast is Data New England's very first initiative created with the intention of offering a practical on the go resource for extremely busy data enthusiasts like you and me from various realms and industries i'm your host nupur gandhi and i'm so thrilled to have nicole jane waples as our very first podcast guest on season 2 of the data perspectives podcast nicole offers a proven track record of applying data strategy and related disciplines to solve clients most pressing challenges she has worked as a data scientist and a project manager for federal and commercial consulting teams Nicole has written 35 plus medium articles mostly for towards data science. Her business experience includes natural language processing, cloud computing, statistical testing, pricing analysis, ETL processes and web and application development. And just so for everyone's awareness, I have myself been a part of the data community that Nicole runs for a good long year. I've personally seen the work and the scale as well as the impact of the work and I've benefited so much from the articles and her partnership and just her drive to keep the data community running so I'm so thrilled to have Nicole join us today with that Nicole welcome so much to our podcast and we're so Thank glad you. you joined us Thank you Yeah I Thanks so much. Very happy to be here with everyone. And I am personally really glad that you're a part of our community. So, yeah, thanks for contributing your expertise in data and your just general enthusiasm for life is awesome. It really comes through in everything you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I know we have a lot to cover and especially given your expert in various different data domains and speaking of which when I think about your profile you have really worked as a data consultant as well as a data scientist additionally you've also worked as a data strategy at a certain points in your career lately i believe you are like full time into the role of the community if you don't mind walking us down through your acting career trajectory sure yeah it has been very interesting is a good way to put it i've done all the things that you mentioned but <laughs> in a roundabout way so i studied sort of general liberal arts when i was in college and i thought i would do something different but i went into the classic career for people who don't really know what they want to do which is management consulting so i graduated and i got this amazing job developed a lot of really great expertise across various industries working on all these different projects I think I was on 10 different projects over the course of 2 years and 9 months. But by the time I quit, I really knew that I wanted to focus on analytics. And so I spent the past year kind of self-teaching Python whenever I had a spare moment or like on weekends. Unfortunately, also family vacations. My family was like, "Where are you?" And then I was learning Python. So I graduated from a boot camp in early 2020. So you can probably tell how the story is about to go. I started my first job the week of the shutdowns in states due to COVID. Yeah, so it was like very different. Like my life went suddenly from traveling four days a week all over the United States, living out of hotels, racking up lots of Marriott points, to suddenly just like existing in my apartment. And I think like obviously COVID was. a hard time for the world a lot of people really suffered and the illness is just getting and I don't want to take anything away from that but this change of pace was really good for me i just remember this was the first job that i had that i really enjoyed and yeah i hate to say it but i just really benefited from getting to be in my own space for once as an adult and I would take a nap every day after lunch. I'd be like, "Okay, work through lunch and just try to be really efficient and then go lay in the sun for like 10 to 30 minutes." And just being able to do that every day was like such a blessing after going from the work that I was doing before. So COVID was like overall for everyone a net negative. For my individual experience in this time being an introvert working for the first time 
in a new field, it just really enabled me to be very focused and also like practice self-care. Anyway, this was my first experience as a data scientist. We did a, a natural language processing project. So the work that I was doing was very engaging, taking a model from Hugging Face, which is a library of pre-trained models, and then fine-tuning it for the specific needs of our client, a government agency, and making this really cool tool for a very specific use case. Again, this was 2020, so this was still in the days of narrow AI, and you really had to like it, I know the machine learning tools that are available now have like really blown people's minds, but having worked just three years ago, even in like implementing what was at the time, like a state of the art and just being so frustrated with what's called catastrophic forgetting, where mm -hmm. you train it on a specific domain and then it's, it can't talk to you about other things. If we were like interrogating our model about what it knew about sports. It can't tell you like what's the capital of Paris and also provide the tools that we needed for our project. So things have really changed. Happy to talk more about that later. So anyway, this was my work that I'd been hired to do. Did that for about six months, built out some capabilities for the firm that had hired me that the whole project, like the building out of the model and then documenting it and thinking through how my firm could do more projects like this. This work took about nine months. My next project was a database migration. So learned a bit about a SQL and knew how to write queries, but this was like actually being a SQL administrator, which was a new skill set for me. And then my next project was a good classic data project where we were helping a new office set up their data collection methodology and think through how they would use the data that they gathered to create the success or failure of various pilot projects. So this was super cool. And I was very happy that I had the data management body of knowledge from DEMA, more commonly known as the DM Bach, at my desk at all times and closing it very Frequently, I had completed the associated certification, which is called the Certified Data Management Professional or CDMP in late 2020. Yeah, happy to talk more about all those things. I realize this intro is going really long, but just to wrap it up quickly, in the process of doing all of the coding for the model, I also built a front end and I used a tool called Streamlit to do this. It's really great. If you have Python, then you can use Streamlit to make a front end, which Typically, front ends are written in JavaScript, which is also not challenging to learn, but Streamlit makes this incredibly snappy and their pre-built components look really good. You don't have to worry about styling and you can build a front end for a model that you're hosting in Amazon EC2. So we set all of this up basically. And that was my gateway drug. I got hooked on front end and I just loved the process of building a tool that our client could go and use and they could access the insights from natural language processing on their own without the intermediary of a data analytics team. I really loved this idea and I really missed coding, frankly. So I reskilled as a software engineer and I worked in front end for a year before quitting my job on Monday, actually. We're talking on a Thursday, so it's four days ago now. I am officially full-time on data strategy professionals. So this has been so fun because it combines all of my interests. And I really couldn't ask for a better community or a better job. And like, just to make this more concrete, like I create training for people to help them learn best practices in data management. I work with people like just who come into the communities for free, right? So I just get to talk to a lot of people and feel like I'm helping them, providing these resources and solving their challenges. And then I also did the website for data strategy professionals. So against my better judgment, the website is in React. Looking back, I wish I'd done something that was more pre-built and standard, but it is fun to get to code in JavaScript still. And I also write. So this was the final piece of the puzzle for me was a lot of writing blogs and medium articles, things like this. And this is how data professionals took off and became successful. So lots to <laughs> chat more about. Oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start off with. Firstly, let me give a big shout out and kudos to you for bringing the element of authenticity in your answer. We always think, 
as professionals, oh, this person went from this role to that role, and that's how they step up that ladder. But really, we need to be mindful that life happens in between, right? Like the examples that you gave of COVID and your life changing 360 degrees, right? From yeah. traveling full time to getting time for yourself, that self-realization and self-awareness journey that really helped you get to where you are, right? That self-discovery of what you really enjoy, you miss coding. We are usually just used to seeing like the tip of the iceberg. So I'm so glad we spoke about all these human aspects of what it takes to move to a different role. And I totally agree with you. I had the good fortune of seeing a stream demo, in fact, just two weeks back, and I was just amazed at its capabilities. So yeah, I'm already amazed of all the data expertise that you have and the impact that you bring to the data community. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you a few specific questions. So as you mentioned, you are the founder of the Data Strategy Professionals Group, and I personally found your website pretty neat. So you have a couple study plans for different certifications alongside other data offering is your different trainings, either in data science, data privacy, and data analytics. And how I met you really is I wanted to get into trying to get the data certification. CDMP started for myself, and I was looking for some study groups and I found your group on Facebook and you were so warm and approachable right from the get-go and while I haven't made time for pursuing the exam there was so much support and resources available not just on your group but also on your LinkedIn group which has a huge membership, right? I think 2,000 members. So yeah, I think firstly, it's an offbeat path for a traditional young professional that you've taken. So a big kudos to you for taking on that journey. If you don't mind walking us through your journey as a founder, what spurred your interest, if you have any success stories, and especially if you have any challenges. Yeah. Thanks. A lot to dig into there. So the started as a blog, which is really cool. I was getting a lot of good feedback from my writing on Medium. There's a lot of data scientists who hang out on that platform. It's basically like long form Twitter. If you've never gone to Medium before, I recommend checking it out. It's really inexpensive and accessible. They have like the freemium model. So anyway, I've written for Towards Data Science and Better Programming and a couple of other publications. But yeah, at the time, around when I was taking the Certified Data Management Professional exam, I wrote a blog post that explained my experience. So just, oh, this test seems really underrated. It's super helpful. It covers 14 distinct topic area along the data pipeline. So everything from how do you set up the processes for data governance through how do you check to make sure that data quality is and how you really secure your data systems, technical fields, like how do you do data architecture and modeling, a little bit about advanced analytics, business intelligence, and data science. So there's 14 chapters that are tested from the DMBOK the book that I mentioned earlier on this certification. And I should also say it's an open book test, which is really valuable because that mirrors real world conditions where if you really need to, you can always go look something up. So even though you have a set time limit for the exam, you do have to make sure you know your stuff, but then you don't have to really rely on memorization for everything. This was basically what was in the content of this write-up and that blog post did really well on towards data science. And then I had this feeling of, like, oh, maybe I can serve this audience in another way. So I created a Facebook group initially and people joined it after having read the article or they just were searching for CDMP on Facebook and they found the study group, which is pretty cool. So a lot of our traffic has been organic and we've just grown incrementally over time. I released the study plan like a few weeks 
or excuse me, weeks. It took me months to figure out exactly what the best way to do this would be. But I was able to come up with a way to distribute this plan that emphasizes studying efficiently so you can get more knowledge essentially, and spend time reviewing the most important chapters that are going to be tested on the exam. And I think this really is helpful to people so that they can study and pass the exam in 90 days or faster. People can also opt in for what we call immediate access, where they get all the materials at once. So yeah, the study plan was our initial offering. And because that went well, we also have released a couple of other things like study notes, which are more like a quick debrief from each chapter practice question. And now we have a membership, which is a more intentional community for people who are very serious about studying and it provides accountability and also events. So live trainings, access to prior recording of these training, and then like a digital workspace. So more of a collaborative community that's like above in terms of the seriousness, what's presented on LinkedIn and Facebook. We also hope to cover other certifications in a similar level of detail and quality of product. I mentioned I worked as a data scientist and that's a field that's like very near and dear to my heart. This would include like coming up with training materials for data science certification and then also like data analytics. There's other data related certs that are there beyond the CDMP. Obviously, I think has a lot of value and I've used that information a ton as a data strategy consultant. But if you're more on a data analytics track, then there's other offerings that might be a better fit for you. And we want to make sure we're supporting those people as well to just cover more of the landscape of data related certifications to the point where eventually like we're the single trusted provider for any major data related cert. We'd ideally have a course that you could take and a community for you to join so that you can advance your skills in that area. That's so cool. And I can totally vouch that I have availed the 90 day study plan. And while I had other competing priorities at work as well as in life, I couldn't get through my CDMP exam, but the study material was so on point. And just so everyone knows, I'm part of Emma New England. We do have bi-weekly CDMP study sessions, to be honest with. I've been attending those on and off. And alongside with that, right, the email study plan that Nicole sent over the course of 90 days was a great additional support that I needed. Like it literally told me this is what you should read and this is the high levels, right? We all know Dimbok is such a huge body of knowledge. And if you're trying to give that exam, you really need to break it down into small steps that we can digest, understand the high level go through it and then remember what you started through, right? So instead, Nicole has taken the pain to do all of that for all of you. So if you're ever thinking of a CDMP, I would highly urge that all of you either be a part of her study groups, join the data professionals group, and alongside, feel free to avail her study plans, which are so helpful. Just so as aware, Nicole has written around 35 articles on the medium mum. The articles are mostly get towards data science, but Nicole, as I was studying some of the articles about different data domains, some around data strategy, some around CDMP, NLP, Python apps, even the certification. So firstly, I think that's a great platform and I'm so glad you have leveraged that platform as an additional data voice to share your insights to the data community. I think the articles are so much on point. I'm myself a huge Medium fan, and I'm a huge fan of your writing work on Medium. You have around 2,000 followers, if I'm not wrong. So the journey that you're taking on the, as a data entrepreneur is really inspiring. Wondering if you don't mind giving us a quick overview of you pouring into writing alongside with all of your work. Thank you so much. And yeah, thanks for your kind words about the study plan as well. I'm glad that you found that to be as helpful as you did. And sure. yeah, the CDMP will be there for you, Nipper, when you're ready to come back and take mm -hmm. it. We'll still, the great sure. thing about data is that it's really just always valuable. So these skills and techniques that you learn in, in the course of studying, like they will be just as relevant when it comes time for you to take the exam. <laughs> okay, now getting back to Medium. Yeah, I just like really love to write. And I know that's not true for everyone, but whatever your kind of, wherever your creativity takes you, if you can 
have some fun and also maybe use it to deepen your knowledge of your field. Like this is something to consider. Yeah, this was, I just found it to be so fun. I would wake up really early (laughs) during COVID and write these medium articles about things that I was doing at work or things that I had heard on a data science related podcast. And it was a great way for me to remix what I was hearing and then make it something that I really had learned and understood more fully. So it's great for me. And I'm glad that other people find the writing to be helpful to them too. Increasingly, the blog will be covering data strategy related topics. This is my professional work now. There's just so much to cover in this domain, right? Making good choices, good data-driven decisions. There's a lot that can be said about this. So I'm really excited about some of the articles that I have been working on and will be continuing to share on Medium. That's so cool. I'm glad you found your release through Medium and it's so much joy to read through your articles. And just a quick thing, I know you spoke about the benefit of CDMP on a high level. Uh, If you don't mind helping everyone connect how the CDMP is related to DEMA membership. Yep. So when you purchase the CDMP, this is $300 and it will give you access to take the test at some point in the future. And it also gives you a limited access to the International Data Management Association for a set period of time. Then you can avail yourself of the benefits of membership in DEMA. I'm not affiliated with DEMA, but I do think people should take every opportunity they can to join communities. We are social creatures and we learn best in the company of other people who have similarly ambitious goals. So yeah, I think if you're considering taking the CDMP, then actually just going out and buying the test, even well before you're you're like quote unquote ready, this is like one, it's a good commitment device because once you've dropped the money, then you have that sunk cost. And if you're sure you're going to take it, then you might as well just go ahead and do this and join DAMA. And another benefit of this that's included when you purchase the test is access to the test bank of questions that are like officially synced by DAMA. So as we mentioned, my company also sells practice questions. And if you feel that the questions that are provided by DAMA are sufficient, then you don't need to go out and buy any more, of course. But it has been shown that testing yourself on the things that you're studying is a very important way to learn because that like slight stress of seeing a question and like having to rack your brains and come up with the answer, this deepens the pathways in our brain to the information. So yeah, that you can do that is thing in that way. Another sort of similar study technique is to take out a blank sheet of paper and then challenge yourself to write out as much as you can, whether it's like diagrams, your bulleted notes, or a concept map for each of the chapters that I mentioned that it will be tested on the exam. So this is similar to doing practice questions, but even more unstructured. But yes, these things are good ways to study. And we encourage you to do stuff like this throughout the study plan so that you are saving yourself time and you're sufficiently prepared when you're ready to finally sit down and take the test. Yep, that's so cool. Thank you. I appreciate that information. And as I think about you, you are so active, not just on Medium, LinkedIn, but you're always wanting to keep up with either the current trends in data management or even as things like, what books should I be reading if I want to improve my skill set in a specific data domain. I have seen some of your articles around the current trends in data management, and they span all across from the trends such as AI, language Mm -hmm. model, data privacy, cloud architecture. So do you mind giving us a quick perspective about what do you think are the current trends in data management and how should someone up with all of this? Oh yeah, I'd be happy to. So 
I will say that the core principles of data management are pretty much unchanging. So what you need for a good data governance program is pretty resistant to the ever-change, ever-improving, relentless march of progress in technology. Same thing, like data quality. There are various tools that are coming online that we can use to check out the data quality or create new metadata tags and like improved data catalogs and like access to these resources, et cetera. So the tools are getting better, but the principles that are taught in the data management body of knowledge and tested on the CDMP exam, these don't really change. So that's great. But then around the edges, there are still a lot of things that are rapidly changing. And these are great fodder for Medium articles. As you might imagine, it's like all about the newest and the latest and just staying on the cutting edge in terms of this is what it takes to write a popular blog post. I think the one that you're referencing in particular is called Five Considerations for Crafting a Winning Data Strategy in 2023. And in this particular post, I write about the importance of data labeling for the machine learning and AI research community, sort of increasing trend towards data sharing agreements. So this is between various countries, different multinational entities, how like data sharing is becoming more the norm. So that's good. Also the impact of data privacy regulation in the US. Famously, there's GDPR in Europe, which came in, it was written in 2016 and came in in 2018. So that has had a huge impact on the global standards for privacy for any business that wants to potentially have customers in Europe. They need to be aware of how to be compliant with GDPR. We're going to see a patchwork of regulations in the United States. So five states in 2023 will have data privacy regulations in place in their state by the end of the year. So this is still quite a challenge because we're unlikely to get federal policy on data privacy. It doesn't seem likely this year. So this is quite an interesting issue to follow and to think through how it will impact businesses and the rights of consumers. Another thing closely related is advertisers losing access to your data. So this is what related to the prior point on data privacy and like this top-down government regulation, but also the app platforms play a pretty significant role in thing, how business plays out for these advertisers. So Apple famously put in place the app tracking transparency policy in 2021. And this is tightening the reins on the data that Meta in particular can track across its behavior on the web. Anyway, so the article talks about some of the implications of this. And then the final thing that I want to touch on, which I think is really important as we continue into 2023, is like the importance of cloud. So if I have one single of the data management body of knowledge, or like to put this in a more positive framing, if I have one thing that I really am hopeful that they will talk more about in the DMBOK version three, when that comes out, it would be talking about the importance of cloud and cloud, like you could fit this into the data storage chapter. And yeah, it really has become the predominant model for large enterprise and small to medium businesses to put their data in the cloud. And then the thing that we talk about in this article is advancements into the multi-cloud. So it's really the case that you would need to pick one single vendor and just stick with them no matter what. Increase we're seeing businesses become more informers when it comes to cloud products. And so they're choosing the best of breed for a particular service, not necessarily having loyalty to one single cloud provider. So this is great because it drives costs down and it really forces these major tech companies to compete on quality and tears down the barriers, the potential like lock-in effects, et cetera, of having all of your data in one place. So yeah, a lot of these are like positive and or ambiguous. So just to wrap this up, those are like five developments that I think are important to think about in terms of how your organization approaches data strategy. And some of these categories that I've mentioned, they may be more or less relevant depending on what kind of business that you're operating or what sort of space your organization plays in. One thing that I didn't mention in this article, but really deserves its own <laughs> extensive consideration 
is of course the rise of large language models. So yeah, I could talk a lot about how I think data practitioners need to consider the implications of these models like more broadly across creators, businesses and consumers. And then another aspect of this is how they themselves could become consumers and how they should update their tools and workflow processes in order to just take advantage of the efficiency gains from using generative text to, excuse me, using generative text models. Cool. Thank you. That was a great walkover. Clear one thing that comes across in talking to you, through reading your article or keeping up with your work on the data strategy professionals group is you are a source of insights and most importantly, a lot of great inspiration. That's also a great segue for me to ask you one quick question as to how deep yourself inspired. You have clearly shown great drive to get to the bottom of new trend or enlighten the data community. And I'm personally curious as to what keeps you going? Do you lean into book, podcast, or people for your inspiration? What a great question. I would say all of the above. books are wonderful. They are like going inside of someone's brain. <laughs> There's really no, it, there's no comparison to like the written word for getting inside of the way that people articulate their own consciousness. Like watching a movie, it doesn't put you in someone's way of thinking in the same way. Only really writing so far is a technology that does this. And, uh, and so I think that if someone has taken the time to craft a book, it's like you're going into their worldview a little bit. So this can be really interesting. Not, I'm not just talking about data books, obviously, because hopefully data isn't like someone's sole thing that they're thinking about on the day-to-day. -day. But anyway, data books are great. I have a number of recommendations. Again, on Medium, on our site, we have our own little blog on datapros.com. But yeah, so even as wonderful as I think books are, I do want to caution that it's an antiquated technology in a way in that it is it's there's not really a an overwhelming reason why knowledge needs to be written down in text and communicated in this package of pages that are a certain size and maybe about 200 to 600 of them and bound together and then you carry this around and that is the way that you learn like clearly this technology like made sense at the time when it came about and books aren't going away if you really did it's like you can ask yourself this question of okay are books really the best way to learn and it's pretty obvious that like they're not our brains learn best in a non-linear structure where we can go back and forth. So imagine if you're reading a nonfiction book, if it had a component where like you get to the end of a chapter and then it gave you prompts to go back and reread sections of the chapter so that you heard the things that were most important. Or it was like, oh yeah, jump ahead to this section and you'll see how it connects back to the information that you just read. Or go back many chapters and think about how what you're reading again for the second time how it's changed by the new information that you just learned and these are cues that books like typically don't have i guess some textbooks books that are written specifically for pedagogical purposes they would have they might have cues like this but i really think that this is lacking and i, I think this is quite sad because a lot of people just there's a lot of studies that show that people have this illusion of knowing after they're reading a book. But really, if you prompt them a little further, they struggle to remember what they read. It's more just like they, they gain access to a worldview and to a feeling of understanding, but then they're really not, I think, like gaining knowledge in the most efficient way. And I think this is sort of something that people should spend more time thinking about, especially if they read a lot of books or if they're writing a book. So this is why I really like blog posts because they're like quite condensed and you lack that feeling of comprehensive worldview entering, but you gain the efficiency of learning knowledge in a more compact format. And you can create your own sort of study and review schedule. If you use a tool like Anki, for example, to build flashcards, you can set up a schedule to review topics that you're like really interested in and make sure that you're like really understanding them. I think this is 
a thing that people don't do as much in their day-to-day life that maybe they should do more of. And also I'm a huge podcast fan because frankly, I'm like very active and the way that I'm wired, I just don't like to sit down. I don't know why that is. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing, but I really like to like walk around. I'm like pretty excited about running and things like this. So I definitely leverage podcasts so that I'm using that time more effectively and like listening on two speed or greater or less, depending on how the speed of the speaker and like the complexity of the topic, but definitely trying to dial in and find the right speed so that I'm gaining knowledge efficiently, but like also still having time to think about what I'm learning and make sure that I'm actually really understanding it. So anyway, this is like when we're talking about like inspiration, it's not like a specific person or topic. It's more just understanding, I think the relative pros and cons of various types of media, which like really the way that the medium is the message, I think is a saying. And, and this is really true for how we learn that it really impacts the way that we think about things. So just understand that and getting better over time about finding good information and like keeping myself entertained and bring new topics, things like this. That's so cool. What a beautiful answer, by the way, it was definitely a refreshing answer and such an honest one. And in fact, throughout the podcast, what I really enjoyed is how much candor you've infused in all of your answers. I can so much relate to the topic you're making about books. I'm personally a very slow reader. We try to take a lot of notes here and there. Exact point that you made about those prompts, right? We need to do that little bit of work in between, either mentally or physically by taking some notes. And you just nail that answer right there. We need to think a little differently about how we process the information that we get from either books, audio books, or even podcasts. You mentioned about the speed and that's a huge part, right? While speed is a good thing, how do you balance it with still trying to retain what is there and trying to see how you retain is applicable to it or you can reflect on it? So cool answer. With that, I'm sure you would have some great words of wisdom for our Aspire Data enthusiast. It's my personal favorite question. And usually I like to ask, hey, what's what are the words of wisdom for aspiring data enthusiasts listening to our podcast? But specifically for you, I would just preface it with you you are yourself a very young and aspiring data enthusiast. If someone wanna get into the role that you are, what you're doing right now, that that would be really insightful for all of us. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a really excellent question. So there's two parts to this, I think, if I'm understanding the question correctly. The first part is, what advice would I give to an inspiring, aspiring data enthusiast? And the second question is, what advice would I give to an aspiring entrepreneur? Mm-hmm. Okay, great. For the part one, my business is in certifications. So I will mention that. I will also say that the real value of a certification is not in adding a new picture to your that aspect of your LinkedIn profile, adding another line to your resume. The real value is in the knowledge that you gain and then how you can use it to improve the operations of your organization. So yeah, I'm super glad that I started with data strategy because I really believe that this kind of could make the world better. <laughs> If people like understood the 14 domains that are, that you learn and you really, really internalize as you're studying for this test. And like I said, like testing is a great way to deepen long-term knowing. There's, There's really no substitute for that. It is the best way. So the test then is instrumental to internalizing this knowledge of the principles of data strategy. And then you just take that with you for the rest of your life. No matter where you go, you're going to have to deal with data. So yeah, I think taking the CDMP exam is the piece of advice that I would recommend for people who are just getting started on their data journey or who works in data and they want to know how to deepen their expertise. That's what I would recommend. Awesome. Um, And yeah. (laughs) Yeah, if you don't mind getting into the second part of the question. Yeah, okay, entrepreneurship. So this is quite different from many of the other things that I've done in life. It's very different than 
writing a performant Python program or communicating the results of data analysis or being a good employee where you learn to anticipate the needs of your boss and what their weaknesses might be and help them to like make their less relevant, right? Like maybe you just do for them what they are not so good at doing and just finding other ways to make them look good and thereby (laughs) rising up the corporate ladder. These are all like very individual skills. And I don't really think I do any of that like anymore. I'm my own weird boss. So I, my weaknesses, I've got to figure out how to help other people help me. (laughs) But yeah, I guess like the main actually tactical piece of advice here is try to make money. And that sounds really silly, but yeah, just make, if you make something that people will pay you for, that is how you, that's how you know you're adding value. And this is obviously way more difficult than it sounds because there's lots of things that people want, but they're not really willing to pay a lot of money for. There's a lot of people trying to make money. (laughs) <laughs> but I also think I also talk to entrepreneurs and they're like, oh, I want to do this thing. It's going to make people's lives better. And then they'll pay me. And I'm like, start with the, how do you get people to pay you? And then start with, how do you make those people's lives better? So it's just reversing your thinking on it. And yeah, that's how you have a sustainable business. I think this is the mindset shift that I recommend for people who are very early on in their journey and they're still trying to decide how to scope their project and like how to get product market fit. And then, yeah, and blogging, like, has been hugely important for my progression. It does not have to be blogging though. Like we talked about writing isn't even necessarily required to get your ideas across. Right now we have this like huge wealth of information on YouTube. And if you don't like to write, try making a YouTube video and you can even hire someone to edit it for you. But yeah, just finding a way to build an audience is, I would not have succeeded without that. There's definitely other ways to go about the making money thing. But if you're a small time content creator, then you can bootstrap that into an entrepreneurial thing via what Seth Godin referred to as the like 1000 true fans. And this is the idea of, oh, if you have an audience of people, figure out what those people have in common, like what problem they have, and then figure out a way to help them with that problem that they're willing to pay you for. And then he was like, yeah, if you have a thousand people who are willing to pay you, you can pretty much live on that. I don't know that it's necessarily a thousand. For me, it seems like it's maybe like 2000. That's where we're at right now. And this is the point where I feel comfortable quitting my job to pursue this full-time more seriously. But the 1000 true fans idea is really because it's about service first and about figuring out again, how to make money like first, but doing it for a very specific avatar that you've found and created through your content. So that's how I want to tie it all together. Definitely not an idea. Shout out again to Seth Godin for being a brilliant writer and marketer. I like accidentally did this and then discovered his writing. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I need to be more intentional in in this direction because he said it worked. And I think this is what I would tell entrepreneurs is to, I just boil it down again to two key points. The first one is make money first. And the second one is build an audience, figure out what they have in common and again, make money. (laughs) So those are the recommendation for anyone who's listening and happens to want to pursue this kind of wild, risky path. Yes. Thank you. I so appreciate you getting into every tiny aspect of it. For a few folks, it can be a good side hustle, but if you're really going to go get bold and courageous and take it on as your full-time job, you need to make sure you're you're getting paid, right? And at the same time, while money might not be a huge driver for your success, you need to still earn money, but yet see that once you start earning money along with that, how can you bring more value and impact to however small or loyal members or data community members you have. Talk a lot more about this, where there's a lot of things that I think add a lot of value to our lives and a lot of things that make for very good uses of your time and could be personally fulfilling, but will never make you money. And I just think if you are drawn in that direction, like definitely pursue that instead. I don't, I think there's like this tendency to be like, people either look at making money as being like a really good thing, or they look down on it as being a really bad thing, but it's just like an inherent aspect of certain 
ways to use your time. And it's just, for example, I tried to start my first business in the history of like travel and museums and appreciating art. And I don't want to get into the whole thing, but basically like this was not an effective business idea, but it does not mean that starting a community around museums and art appreciation wouldn't be an amazing way to make incredible connections and create a community just in terms of like art appreciation. But again, like it would not be a path that I recommend for entrepreneurs necessarily. So if entrepreneurship is your goal, you just need to pick your path and pursue that. But if you have hobbies that you're not going to monetize, those might be equally fulfilling or more fulfilling. And that's okay too. Nicole, you definitely opened up some of my thought processes as you spoke about how money being an inherent part. I personally think you have so many insights and those insights are not just practical, but those perspectives are hugely eye-opening. And I now feel very, (laughs) I feel missed out on having, not having had the time to connect more often with you. I'm definitely going to make it a point to attend some of the data strategy hangouts or the coffee chats. I don't know you are huge on that. You just love to meet different people, get to know their insights and at the same time share your insights. All I would just say is it was super cool to listen to how you thought through it and the summary that you brought together. So thank you for sharing that. And with that, I'm just going to say you've been so, so much incredibly generous with your time. I do have two quick questions for you. One is, how should the audience reach you? And what's the best way for them to connect with you? And then before we get into that, if you don't mind, I know we are almost out of time, but just a quick rapid fire round is how we end our sessions. So if you're ready, the first question is, one data management book or resource you live by? Okay. So first, the way that people can get in touch with me, our website is called datastrategypros.com. That's data strategy pros, like P-R-O-S, short for professionals. And we have, as Nipper (laughs) is a good representative of our community, we have communities on Facebook and LinkedIn. So if you look up like CDMP study group on Facebook or data strategy professionals on LinkedIn, you'll find those. People can also email me. So I'm, my email is on our website, but it's Nicole Janeway at datastrategypros.com. And then good data book. I feel like at this point, if I said the DM Bach, it would be a cop out. So I'll say Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Klebman. I haven't read the second one that you mentioned. So thank you. That's a great insight. And with that, the second question is you don't feel accomplished until you? Oh gosh. I do have this feeling of, oh, you're only as good as your last long run, speed workout, race whatever it is. So I I have these milestones in my mind. Definitely running has been a great way for me to, to unwind and have goals that are outside of professional goals. I do feel accomplished somewhat in my work. Increasingly, I'm feeling like I'm getting to do the, like I, I mentioned, like the data strategy professionals business combines a lot of my really sort of particular interests. And if I can optimize my life for spending more time on the things that I really love, then that's good. But it's hard to rise out of the day-to-day struggles of, oh, I need to find a contractor who can take on this challenge or this person like has been asking really good questions and I don't have great answers yet. I need to figure this out. These kinds of things, there's just a lot of day-to-day stuff. So I, I don't know that I really feel, I feel accomplished on a broader macro sense, but on a micro sense, it's like, there's just a lot to do. So I like don't know I if said, that answers the question. No, it does, right? 
I love the authenticity of your answers. That's all I would say. <laughs> so okay. I appreciate that view. With that, I fumbled up when I said earlier, I do have always three questions. A fun fact about yourself. I'm currently trying to decide where to live. <laughs> so this is a cool <laughs> thing. It's great to make money online, but it really doesn't solve the problem of like where to go. And I have friends all over the US now, which is like really cool, but I am torn between loving my love of travel and my desire to see more of the world and my desire to, I've literally never stayed in one place long enough to see, to plant a garden and then see the same perennials come up the next year. And I just think there's something really fulfilling and rewarding about a local community and people that you, I love community. I love virtual communities. And I, I think we should all try to strive to make virtual community a part of our lives. But there's also no substitute for knowing the name of your mailman and or mailwoman and like being able to do stuff locally that makes your community better. And I am limited because I just have done a lot of really short-term stays in a lot of different places. So I've got to figure that out. That is so cool. We would love to know where you'll land with that decision you make. <laughs> so thank you. Again, we appreciate the authenticity in your answer. And it was definitely a fun fact. Alrighty. I was like blown away with some of your answers. I'm pretty sure the audience connected more with you as you brought so many different elements, not just the data domains and the expertise around that, but just how you got through some of those answers, right? Like the process, the thinking, just the work that happens in between to, to get to the end result. I think I enjoyed all of it and I'm sure the audience must have felt the same. So with that, I'm pretty sure they'll be looking you up. So if you don't mind just letting us know what's the best way for them to connect with you. Yeah, we have the website datasprose.com. Forgot to mention also Medium, of course. So I'm Nicole Janeway Bills on Medium. We're also like we're on all the text-based social platforms. So I like Twitter too. We have a few YouTube videos. I'm a little bit not as good or I don't enjoy making them, but we do have a few. <laughs> Hopefully they're good. And uh, yeah. And then by email. So Nicole Janeway at datastrategypros.com. Wow, Nicole, I've incredibly enjoyed your time here. Like I said, the common theme was insights and inspiration throughout the podcast. I truly enjoyed working with you, prepping up for this session. Would love to have a lot of different hangouts just to talk about data and life in general. But before we do that, I just want to give a huge shout out to you on behalf of data community in general of the work that you do, the impact that it has, and being the common thread to, to bring together so many folks together. Thank you again for all the great work that you do, and especially a big thank you from Dema New England for being on our podcast and sharing your wonderful insights. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for thinking to reach out to me, and thanks for your work on the podcast. I've enjoyed listening to it and I look forward to the rest of season two. Awesome. Thank you. And with that, I'm also want to thank everyone who tuned into today's session. Hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please do not forget to leave a review or a comment. It will help us immensely. As always, we welcome any feedback. And last but never the least, I want to give a huge shout out to Tema New England, who has really been the driver for enabling this podcast. So if you'd like to share any inputs or thoughts or topics for our next podcast, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or connect with us on our website demanewengland.org and simply click the contact us page and for unpacking more such data insights and knowledge sessions feel free to join at dema new england and consider being a member of our dema new england chapter see you again next quarter for yet another podcast episode and till then stay awesome